This video is sponsored by Audible. Hi, my name is Larry and I'm a physics professor here at the University College Collegiate. I think we can all agree that everyone's favorite part of taking a class is being given the opportunity to put that newfound knowledge to the test. Who doesn't like a good quiz or exam? So I thought today I would share with you some of my insider tricks on how you can construct the perfect physics exam. But first off, why should you listen to me? Well, I'll let my reputation speak for itself. I found this online, and I think this is what my score would be if I were on Rate My Professors. This is my first year teaching, by the way. The first thing one must acknowledge before trying to write a physics exam is how our understanding of education and, and learning has changed over the years. People learn in different ways. But thankfully, exams are universal. They appeal to everyone's strengths as students. So the visual learners, when I, when I put down the exam, you know, they, they see it which is really beneficial to them. And the kinesthetic learners, they can, they can feel the pages. Okay, so there's something for everyone, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, or just the normal students. I'm sorry, normal students? That's a microaggression. Can we cut that out? I, I, didn't mean to, I didn't mean to say that. So can we do another take? Fine, action. So there's something for everyone, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, or just the normal students. Cut. I did it again. I, uh, let's just move on. Let's just move on. The structure of an exam does depend on the course level. For introductory physics courses, I recommend that there be anywhere from 50 to 300 questions on the physics exam. You want enough so that individually they carry less weight, and it's more forgiving if a student gets one wrong. Even though the more questions there are, the more likely it is for questions to be very similar. So if you get one wrong, then you got the other five wrong that were just like it. Now that's a lot of questions to have to write, but luckily it's on a topic that's been around for over 300 years. Every possible question has already been asked. All you have to do is change the numbers. In the eyes of a first year, that is now a completely different question than the one online. Admittedly, this was more viable before the advent of because nowadays students can just be given answers to any questions and there's not really much you can do from an administrative standpoint because if they're right, they're right. Now what I've found to help deter this behavior is sad truths at very inappropriate times that make it sound like a threat. Hey everyone, I just wanted to let you know that I'm suspecting some of you of cheating and I just want you to know that everyone dies eventually. You see, that kind of statement is what I like to call probably legal, but definitely effective. You should also make a good number of the problems multiple choice. You see, this gives the illusion that the students don't have to do any math, but really it's just a fantastic way to fit more problems onto one page. And lastly, the topic of formula sheets can be a bit controversial, should you provide one or not. I can see both sides, but personally I err on the side of providing one, however the formulas on there won't be useful, so it's a good compromise. I may ask the student to calculate the electric field due to a point charge, and I'll provide them with the equation for the magnetic field of a solenoid. As the students progress throughout physics, they become wise to the fact that changing numbers isn't actually changing the problem. They also become a lot more proficient with mathematics and manipulating variables and equations. For this reason, you can now generalize the problems and bring it down from 50 to about 4. Between you and me though, it's really just because I might not have a TA for that class and I don't want to grade that many problems. It can be very difficult to come up with upper level physics questions and you don't want to take them straight from Griffiths or something because word will spread and students will actually know what to study. So instead I recommend finding your nearest 40 year old Russian or German physics textbook, translating questions from there and just using those. It's also very common for the students to be taking their upper level math in parallel with the physics course that uses it. So if they're learning eigenfunctions and eigenvalues next week in differential equations, I'll give them an exam this week on the Schrodinger equation, that way they can put to the test what they're about to learn. We should of course aim to be reasonable when giving exams, so however long it takes you, the professor, to complete it, be sure to tack on an extra 30 seconds, that way your students have enough time to finish. But under no circumstances should they be permitted to remove any pages from the stapled exam. I, I don't know why, but that's very important to me. As for formulas, at this stage, some things should be committed to memory. I may provide you with F equals MA, but you're expected to memorize the Laplacian and spherical coordinates. Now, because you wrote an exam that can only be solved in the allotted time if you already know the answers, like you did, students may neglect to simplify expressions that they're meant to derive, making it so difficult on our end to tell if they got the correct answer or not. 
Now, if this happens to you, I recommend just taking off half points and saying, see solution. Then they can come to you later and say if their solution was actually correct or not. Regardless of the course, believe me, you never want to make an exam too easy. The last thing a student wants is to feel like their potential isn't truly being assessed. Right, but you can always have a friendly environment and lead with a joke saying, oh, I might have made this exam too easy to give them a scare. But then you see the tears of relief once they learn that that's just not the case. But I really hope this has provided you with some insight on how to properly make a physics exam. It's too bad there's not an exam on this. <laughs> so stupid. If you have any questions, my office hours are 1.20 p.m. to 4 a.m. Mondays and Saturdays. If I don't answer, it's because I'm probably listening to one of my audiobooks. <laughs> Actually, since that's being brought up so organically, huge thanks to Audible for sponsoring this video. Now, if you don't know, Audible offers a massive collection of audiobooks, podcasts, and, and much more than that. And what you might not know about me is I am a huge, uh, well actually, Lord of the Rings fan. Pretend that this is Unreal Flame of the West, please, or this will make no sense. But I was super stoked to find that not only does Audible offer the audiobook versions for the Lord of the Rings trilogy, so that's Fellowship of the Ring, Two Towers, and Return of the King, but also the Silmarillion, which if you're unfamiliar, it basically puts the lore in the Lord of the Rings. All of the stuff that comes before is in that. Now, I haven't read it personally because I'm not a particularly strong reader, and now I don't have to. I can just reap the benefits without having to do any work, which is awesome. Now, if you're an Audible member, you get access to one free audiobook per month, as well as access to their Plus catalog. Now, you can get started with a free 30-day trial by clicking the link in the description or by texting Andrew Dotson to 500-500. So, huge thanks to Audible for sponsoring this video, and thank Thank you for watching.